Welcome to the Jungian Anthology Podcast, analytical psychology seminars from the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. Jungian Women, the First Generation, with June Singer, Ph.D. This episode is part one of the series, Jungians Speak About Jungian Women. Women's contributions have been central to the development of analytical psychology from its inception to the present. Their contributions include direct collaborations with Jung, amplification and interpretation of his ideas, and original theoretical contributions to the field. This special program includes lectures and discussion to explore the life, work, and influence of six Jungian women who have contributed significantly to the history of analytical psychology. The speakers are practicing analysts who talk about the ways in which these women have personally affected their own psychological and spiritual development and their work with clients. Through personal reflections and reminiscence of the speakers, listeners will come to know and appreciate the contributions of a wide range of Jungian women to the theory and practice of analytical psychology. Topics and speakers included in Jungian Speak About Jungian Women are The First Generation by June Singer, Esther Harding by Mary Doherty, Helen Luke by Carol Donnelly, Emma Young by Carol Sorg, Tony Wolf by Sue Rosenthal, Marie Louise von Franz by Judy Shaw, and June Singer by Marie Stein. June Singer, PhD, was a practicing psychoanalyst in the Chicago area and Tennessee for almost 50 years. She also taught at the University of Chicago, in addition to lecturing as a psychologist throughout the world. A link to the complete series is included in our show notes, as well as a link to more seminars by Dr. Singer. Jungians Speak About Jungian Women, featuring June Singer, with additional lectures by Mary Doherty, Carol Donnelly, Sue G. Rosenthal, Judith Shaw, Carol Sorg, and Marie Stein. Recorded at the C.G. Young Institute of Chicago on November 9th and 10th, 2001. The First Generation by June Singer While Jung himself is the conductor of the Institute's chorus, the chorus of those who seek ultimate truth, it is surely June Singer who first brought this body together and sounded the pitch that still reverberates among us. June needs no introduction to our community. She has been Ur Mother, guiding force, generous benefactor, since the Institute was a small reading group in her living room. There is probably nobody here who has not read one or all of her wonderfully conceived and beautifully written books. She was an important forerunner of those associated with the development of transpersonal psychology and wrote about it in a number of brilliant papers more than 20 years ago. By the way, those are still in our library. And she is one of the few analysts still to talk about this aspect of psychology. But tonight, we are not here to talk to June about her accomplishments, but to learn from her about those years when she was self-inventing, inventing the pioneer woman analyst, writer, and speaker we know and revere. We are here tonight instead to hear June talk about the Jungian women whom she knew personally and was influenced by in her years in Zurich and afterwards. We are in for a very special evening, and we welcome you warmly. June Singer. ever turns out the way you envision it at the beginning, does it? (laughs) And certainly being here tonight is not the way I envisioned the Young Institute so many years ago. In fact, I didn't even envision an institute. I envisioned 
learning and studying and being with people who were interested as I was in Jung and wanted to learn more about it. And it's still happening. It's still happening. I'm still here. You're still here. And some people here I've known for a very long time and I'm very happy to see them again, see you again. And those of you whom I haven't met before, it's just a delight to me to see the new faces and the new excitement that fills this place. I'm going to talk this evening about the first generation of Jungian women, the women who were trained by Jung and who were his first associates and who really were very prominent in getting the Jungian movement started. Little did I know when I first arrived in Zurich in the cold and dreary winter of 1960 that I was to attend a four-year rehearsal and staging of the drama of the rest of my life. It was a time the late 50s, 60, early 60s, when the favorite book, the most popular book, was The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit. I don't know if any of you remember that one, but it was the organization man, the man who goes along, who does what he's supposed to do, and step by step reaches uh, a position of respectability and conformity. That was the social order of the American system at that time. Just a few years before that, the men of the country had gone off to war, the Second World War, and the women were taking to the factories and the stores and the businesses, and Rosie the Riveter was the famous uh, heroine of the times. But when they came back after 1945 and got their jobs back and the women started producing babies by the dozen, uh, things changed. Women didn't work very often uh, unless they had to do it by financial necessity. If a woman in moderately decent circumstances chose to work, she was unconventional housewives gossiped about her. She did it out, she did it because her husband can't support her. She's too ambitious. Her husband can't keep her happy. Well, in those days, I was married to Richard Singer, and we had been in Chicago uh, for five years before we uh, knew anything or did anything about Jungian psychology. During that time, Dick earned his doctorate in psychology, and I earned my master's degree. And one day, he said to me, uh, I'm planning to go to the Young Institute in Zurich. I was quite surprised. I had, I had broken the mold already by taking a job as an editor of children's books, and now the thought of going to Zurich gave me pause. If I hadn't been reading Jung uh, when I was a teenager, starting around 16, I probably would have thought, this is not for me. But I'd always had a secret interest in Jung. And so I went along. I gave up my job. But I went along to be a housewife for my husband and my teenage daughter, Judy. So it was a cold, wet December morning when we found ourselves at the Pension Florhof in Zurich. We were staying there because we had to find an apartment. We hadn't found one yet. And the next day was Christmas. And Christmas Eve, we went down to the little dining room that they have in these small pensions. And there was a Christmas tree with candles lit candles. That was kind of surprising. And I felt 
very homesick for a holiday time of year where I knew no one. And they brought us for our first course to the table blue trout that had been boiled and it was on the plate as though it were swimming up to you. And I looked into that poor little trout's eyes and I started to cry. <laughs> that was how it began. Then there was the apartment hunting. The, we found a place advertised, but we couldn't speak any German. And we went to the apartment, it seemed okay, but we couldn't talk to the landlady uh, to make arrangements. But fortunately, Judy had enough French, and the Swiss speak French if they don't speak English, uh, along with the German. So we managed to communicate that we would take the apartment, and I managed to get the message that, as Judy uh, translated it, that I would have to sweep the stairs in the hall every Thursday. <laughs> we also got a 32-page booklet telling us what we... Um, what all the regulations were, which we couldn't begin to understand. We took out our German dictionaries and figured out that you don't throw the bones in the toilet. The rest of it, we decided, was just not worth figuring out. So we were moved in early one morning, and once we got settled, we I looked out the window one morning, and there, there was a terrible noise there was a pounding, and I thought, what could that be coming from? And down in the yard below was a woman pounding on a, there was a, a carpet hung over the clothesline, and she was pounding on it with something that looked like a kitchen whip, only it was about six feet long. And um, I found out what she was doing was tepish klopfing, klopfing, yes. Uh, beating the carpets. Well, I thought this is the way the Swiss women work out their frustrations. I could understand that. <laughs> anyway, I soon found out that being a Zurich housewife was pretty boring and frustrating. I finally learned to read the labels on the, uh, bo on the boxes in the grocery store because they didn't have pictures and you didn't know what you were getting unless you could read the label. So every time I went to the grocery store, it was a day's work to, uh, with my dictionary to get the groceries. But before long, I decided that maybe I could go to the Institute once and attend a lecture and see what it was like. Now, in those days, you didn't have to have degrees to go to the Institute. There were people there who were training, but um, if you were a person, just somebody who happened to be there and wanted to hear a lecture about Jung, you could go. So I thought that was a pretty good idea. I would go. I looked over the program and selected a lecture on anima and animus whatever that was. I was especially interested in going to that particular lecture because the, the speaker, Dr. Yolanda Jacobi, was my husband's analyst, and I wanted to check her out. <laughs> she was the first Jungian woman I met. Now, Yolanda Jacobi was born in 1890 in Budapest. In 1960, then, when we got there, she would have been about 70. Her father had been a senator and was a wealthy businessman. And on her mother's side, one of her uncles was a member of parliament and another was a professor of mathematics. Both parents were of Jewish ancestry, but for political reasons, Yolanda had been baptized Roman Catholic. When she was 19, her plans for and advanced education were shelled when she met and married a distinguished Budapest lawyer. He was 14 years her senior. In Budapest, as elsewhere in Europe, one of the topical interests and issues of the new century was the emancipation of women. 
you can be sure this was of great interest to Yolanda. During the First World War, Yolanda sensed that society in which she moved was coming to an end. She insisted on training as a secretary in order, she said, to help her husband. When the communists seized power in Hungary in 1919, she arranged to escape to Vienna through a friend she met while working for her secretarial diploma. Some years after the war, her husband returned to Budapest to resume his law practice. He lived half the time in Budapest and half in Vienna with his family. This left Yolanda free to follow, as Joseph Campbell would say, her bliss. She became deeply involved in an Austrian culture organization. Her energy and initiative brought her to the center of the cultural life in the Austrian capital. She was an extraordinary woman. She first met Jung in 1927 when he was giving a lecture at Vienna. She seized the opportunity to give a luncheon party for them in her apartment. Uh, as she tells it, and I'm quoting from her, at 4.30 the guests left, but Jung stayed on to tell me about the I Ching. We sat on the floor and he showed me how to throw the coins. I still have the piece of paper on which he wrote from memory the 64 hexagrams. Until that day, I had never heard from them, heard of them. And I had never heard of Jung. I didn't even know he existed. The whole afternoon, he talked to me about the unconscious. When I learned about, when I learned about this, that's the end of the quote. When I learned about this, it was clear to me that Jung had an unerring instinct for spotting a truly gifted woman and then to mount a campaign to help her realize her potential. And Jacobi had an unerring insect, instinct for seizing a promising opportunity. A year after their first encounter, Jacobi had a dream and sent it by mail to Jung in Zurich. He answered, now you are caught, you cannot get away. I've often wondered if Jung too wasn't in some way caught. After Hitler came to power in Germany, Jacobi wrote to Jung again, asking him this time if he would train her as an analyst. He replied, only if you take a doctorate first. At the age of 44, Yolanda Jacobi enrolled at the University of Vienna. She was still four months from completing her doctorate when the Nazis occupied Vienna in March 1938. She wrote to Jung saying that she could not complete her, her doctorate and proposed to come at once to Zurich. Think, you know what Jung answered? Don't come without a doctorate. In my opinion, Jung was shrewd enough to make sure that she was deeply committed and motivated and would not rely on her considerable charm and wit to avoid the hard work and risks involved in analysis and training. In danger because of her Jewish ancestry, she went into hiding. She dressed in mourning garments in order to justify wearing a veil. Literally, under the eyes of the Gestapo, she completed her PhD in psychology. Immediately afterward, she went to Zurich. She was nearly 49. Yolanda Jacobi was one of the first women analysts trained by Jung. She wrote several books on Jung's psychology. Her books were clear, articulate, and systematic. They were among the first books to be translated into English and disseminated throughout the English-speaking world. What kind of an analyst was she? She was smart, acerbic, and nothing escaped her scrutiny. She was a dynamic lecturer. 
She didn't hesitate to express her opinion in no uncertain terms. As Dick began analysis with her, I saw changes in him. For one thing, he didn't raise any objections to my going to the class at the Institute. I suspect he had some discussion about this with Dr. Jacoby. At any rate, my first class at the Institute with Dr. Jacoby was on the subject of anima and animus. I listened intently as she described the animus as that unconscious aspect of woman which possesses a great deal of energy and which, when thwarted or disregarded, may either erupt in fury or dissolve into depression. After the class was over, I went up to Dr. Jacoby. I said, Dr. Jacoby, that animus you're talking about, I think maybe I've got one. <laughs> she sized me up with her sharp eyes and answered, maybe you're right. Perhaps you ought to have a talk with an analyst about that. And she suggested Dr. Liliana Fry. <coughs> Liliana Fry. Beautiful white-haired Dr. Fry was an instant hit with me. She listened to me. Not that she said much, but her listening was intense. Maybe it was the quality of her attention, but she broke the dam and let loose a flood of emotions that didn't cease for the four years I worked with her. And work it was. It wasn't that she affirmed my complaints. She took notice of them. She probed ever so gently, and my resistance melted. <clears throat> Sometimes it's the smallest things that make the biggest impressions. The nicest thing I experienced was that when I got up to leave, she would get my coat for me and hold it to help me put it on. If her fingers grazed my shoulder, it made my day. I really loved that woman. She always made sure she understood what I was saying. She was Swiss and her, she spoke English fluently, but it wasn't her native tongue. She knew everything about Nietzsche, the subject of one of her books, but she had little knowledge of our country. One night, I had a dream about a baseball game. She knew nothing about baseball, being a Swiss, so I had to explain in detail what a hit was, what touching base meant, and why a home run was so exciting. When I finished answering her questions, I had a pretty good understanding of my dream. Every day, I would write up my dreams and make entries in my journal. I would usually take the tram to her apartment. And from time to time, I would buy a few flowers at the tram stop and bring them to her. Bless her, she never analyzed why I was doing that. She knew the difference between love and transference. I used to walk back home from our sessions through a lovely park, and I'd often stop and sit on a bench and reflect on the hour we'd had. Those quiet moments were precious. Now, Dr. Fry and I didn't agree about everything. We'd talk about our feelings. She made it clear enough that she had her own standpoint and was not to be moved from what she believed in. But her great gift was that she allowed me my own standpoint as well and didn't attempt to show me the light. She knew that you really can't teach anybody the truest things. All you can do is provide another person with the opportunity and the setting in which the other can discover the truth of her own being. Once I asked her about Jungian women and their relationship to Jung, I was trying to get some idea of the degree of intimacy that existed between Jung and the women he trained and about the relationship of these women among each other. I didn't learn much from Liliana Fry. That whole business was shrouded with an air of mystery. Who was closer to Jung and who was not simply was not discussed and not discussable. 
I got the impression that each woman kept her own course and let the others conjecture about her. There was so much that wasn't said. Among the women, confidentiality, as far as I could see, was respected like a religion. Then there was that duo, Mary Louise von Franz and Barbara Hanna. Soon after I met them, I had a dream in which I saw the two of them as witches around a bonfire, stirring up a brew in a huge cauldron. Neither of these was ever my analyst, although Mary Louise von Franz supervised some of my control cases and Miss Hanna was my thesis advisor. Somehow I never wanted to get my psyche boiled up in their soup, but I did learn a lot from them. Her Dr. von Franz was an acolyte of Jung's. She was a scholar of Latin and Greek, and she researched and translated material in these classical languages for him. She did this in the beginning as payment for her analytic hours. I've often wondered if the two formed an insoluble bond which made it impossible for either one to do without the other. As we have learned since the time of Jung, dual relationships are not very useful in analysis. Or maybe they are so useful that the transference, countertransference cannot be resolved. I never heard von Franz criticize anything Jung had ever said. He was the final authority up until his death and afterward. All her life, she resisted every attempt I know of to amend or adapt Jung's teachings to the changing issues. Oh yes, there was at least one exception. She also trusted the opinion of a one who was not a follower of Jung, her dog. Her dog would sit at her feet while she lectured. Occasionally, the dog would let out a growl. I never knew what that meant, but I'm sure von Franz did. People said that when von Franz held an initial interview to determine whether or not she would take someone into her practice, the dog had a lot to say about that. <laughs> if the dog warmed up to the prospective analysis, he was in. If he expressed this, this, that is, if the dog expressed any disinterest or any sign of hostility, no way. Well, this, of course, is just gossip around the Institute. I never had an initial interview with Jung, Jung, with von Franz, but I heard it said that this was the case. She was a prolific writer with a limitless knowledge of myths and fairy tales and archetypal material. As a lecturer, she knew what she knew and never exhibited any doubt about it. Her two favorite words were always and never. <laughs> if ever there was a Jungian fundamentalist, von Franz was it. <laughs> now, please understand this is my personal opinion. You don't have to take it as anything more than that. Not that she wasn't highly creative and original and wise. She was. But she was fierce in her opposition to anyone who challenged Jung. In that, she was the opposite of Dr. Fry, the supreme relativist. Nothing was certain for Liliana Fry. You needed to look at all the possible viewpoints on any subject. Many years later, I was invited to lecture at the Jung Institute in Zurich. It was at that time that group therapy was just beginning to be explored in the United States. I suggested as my topic, dream work in groups. I learned that Dr. von Franz had opposed this quite vehemently. I remembered that Jung had often expressed the view that when people act in groups, it is the lowest common denominator that gets uh, com gets activated. And then I understood von Franz's opposition. As it happened, 
The students heard that I wanted to speak about dream work in groups and insisted that I be allowed to do this, and I did. Now for Barbara Hanna, Miss Hanna, as everyone called her, lived together with von Franz in a house in the woods for many years. I always found it a pleasure to listen to Miss Hanna. Of all the German-speaking lecturers, I could understand her the best. She spoke in a slow, exact, but fluent German. And why not? She was born in England, the daughter of the Dean of Chichester. In 1928, she came across Jung's article, Women in Europe, and was so impressed that she went on to read all of Jung's works that were available in English at the time. She went to see Jung in Zurich and settled in Switzerland, where she lived until her death. She was a lecturer and a training analyst at the Institute. She learned early on how to enunciate. She lectured in the same way, precise. Almost every sentence would begin with, Jung says, as if he were whispering in her ear. She wrote one of the early biographies of Jung. Her specialty was active imagination. She recognized the potency of the imagination and she treated it with utmost respect. She produced a book titled The Healing Influence of Active Imagination in a Specific Case of Neurosis. It cons this book consists mostly of the journals and drawings of a patient, of course under a pseudonym, with an introduction by Miss Hanna dealing with the practice of active imagination. In <clears throat> this writing preceded all the later and current writing about guided imagery that we hear so much about today. Active imagination, as Ms. Hanna explained, is the exact opposite of guided imagery. In active imagination, the relationship between the ego and the unconscious is inviolable. The unconscious is to be listened to without giving its suggestions or modifying its message. Ms. Hanna described the unconscious as powerful and, and dangerous, not to be taken lightly. The patient deals directly with the archetypal figures that visit, her, that visit her and allows herself to be instructed by these figures that come up in the imagination. The analyst does not interfere in the dialogue that goes on and doesn't add any interpretations of the unconscious material. Active imagination, as Ms. Hannah explained it, demands a, an absolute trust in the unconscious. My own feeling is that when it is practiced in that way, a person takes the risk of not paying enough attention to consciousness. By that I mean not enough attention to relationships in the outer world, to one's responsibility to others, to safeguarding the trust others have put in you. I think people can become too fascinated with the unconscious. I thought that sometimes Miss Hannah depended more on the sixth sense than on the other five senses. And then there was Aniela Jaffe. She was born in Germany, studied psychology at the University of Hamburg, and began analysis with Jung in 1937. She was Jung's devoted secretary and confidant from 1947 until his death in 1961. She was the sole administrator, uh, administrative secretary of the Jung Institute in Zurich when it opened its doors in 1948. I think you see the pattern of how these women did certain things for Jung, more or less in exchange for analysis or part payment or just out of friendship, but there was not that separation that we insist on today. And I think that's uh, very important in understanding why uh, so many women worked with him and were so devoted to him and why he had such close relationships. 
During his last years, Jung dictated to Aniel Jaffe much, much of memories, dreams, and reflections, and he left the work in her hands to complete after his death. She also edited other books of Jung. She edited the collected letters and the uh, Bollingen Foundation C.G. Jung Word and Image. It's uh, noteworthy that she only began writing her own books after Jung's death. I attended some of her classes and found her to be a quiet, gentle woman of extremely fine sensibilities. Her book on Jung's last years is a collection of her essays on some of the most problematic issues in Jung's writings, such as parapsychology, uh, synchronistic phenomena, and alchemy. She did the first book on Jung and National Socialism. Uh, Jung had begun to be criticized uh, for especially by the psychoanalytic establishment saying that Jung uh, was a little too sympathetic or close to the uh, Nazi regime in Germany. She wrote some essays on Jung and National Socialism and said outright that Jung's early views on the Jewish character and on Judaism were false and gave offense. She ascribed these to a lack of comprehension of Judaism and Jewish culture, which is scarcely intelligible today. These are her words, though it was widespread then. Jaffe, a Jew herself, went on to examine the bases of the ongoing misunderstandings about Jung's statements regarding the differences between Aryans and Jews. Gentle though she was, Jaffe did not pull her punches. Well, came April 1964, and both Dick and I received our diplomas and were, became officially dedicated as analysts. And we came back here to Chicago to set up analytic practice. Within the first year after our return, Dick suffered a fatal heart attack. Just a few minutes and he was gone. After that, my own analysis was really put to the test. I was alone. There were no other Jungian analysts in Chicago. And it was a tough time. I contacted the New York Association of Analytical Psychologists and asked if I could uh, go to some of their meetings. And they invited me to join. So typically, I would go into New York once a month and um, <clears throat> had occasion to meet the analysts there. That's where I met Dr. Esther Harding. Before I knew her personally, I had read much of Esther Harding's work, The Way of All Women, The Eye and the Not Eye, Women's Mysteries, and others. I felt that Harding understood the women of the day in a very different way from Jung. Although she had studied with Jung, she understood the living presence of the animus in the woman better, I think, than Jung did which is only natural since she was a gifted woman who could not reconcile the life of the intellectual and spiritual woman with the rather negative attitude Jung sometimes expressed about such women. And she could not reconcile a woman's passion for the creative life with fulfilling the so-called natural role of woman, that is to nurture her family and other relationships above all else. Esther Hardy never married, but I found her one of the most nurturing women I ever knew, and one of the most intellectual as well. Let me tell you how I came to this. Dick had died in February 1965. That summer, summer following that, the Congress 
of the International Association of Analytical Psychologists was to be held in Montreux, Switzerland, and I decided I would go. It was a very hard it was very hard for me to revisit my colleagues from all over the world. Each time a person would come up to me and express sympathy, I would burst into tears and head for the ladies' room, fix my hair, blow my nose, dry my eyes, and return to the group. This happened over and over again. You can imagine the state I was in. Then one day, Esther Harding invited me to have lunch with her and two other colleagues, Drs. Alma Paulson of New York and, Doc, and Elizabeth Osterman of San Francisco. I couldn't believe that I was going to have lunch with three of the most distinguished Jungian analysts in the United States. As we climbed the mountain in a cable car to the restaurant, I felt that I was on my way to Olympus. That day, my mindset changed from self-pity to hope. Back in the States, I took to visiting Esther when I came to New York for the Jungian meetings. She lived alone in a very modest apartment. On her walls were drawings and paintings that she had made of symbols that she had written about in her many books serpents and dragons, mandalas and figures of Demeter and Persephone. She asked me what I had written about for my thesis at the Jung Institute, and I told her it was about William Blake, and she asked to read it. The next time I saw her, she had read it and liked it and suggested that I expand it into a book. She promised to get the Jung Foundation to publish it, and she did. And that was the beginning of my publishing career. I'm happy to say that after several reprints, the book is still in print. One day, and this is still 1965, Chicago, Esther Harding phoned me to tell me that Bill Kennedy, the president of the New York Jung Foundation, would be in Chicago. And could I get a group together to meet and visit with him? Seventeen people met in my living room with Bill Kennedy. They were mostly people who were in analysis with me, and a few of them hoped to become Jungian analysts someday. And I'm happy to say that some of them actually did. Bill Kennedy suggested to the people there that they form a study group to learn more about Jung and his psychology. We started a study group with these people, and after a while it expanded into four study groups in different parts of Chicago. And then we began offering public lectures at the University of Chicago on the campus, and we formed an analytical psychology club, and later a Jung Center, and the rest is here. Now, the other two women that were up the mountain with me were Alma Paulson and Elizabeth Osterman. Alma Paulson was helpful in helping me to develop the Jungian group here before there were any other Jungian analysts. I used to complain to her, couldn't she send me some of her uh, graduates, couldn't she? we find somebody somewhere that would come. And she sympathized, but um, it took a while. She was that rare bird, an extroverted Jungian. She was especially good at building relationships. And her experience as a longtime member of the, uh, of the board of the Jung Foundation was very helpful to me. She really steered me in very useful ways. And now I come to the last of the Jungian women I want to talk about this evening. When I moved from Chicago to California, I met Elizabeth Osterman again, this time as colleague to colleague. She was strikingly beautiful, tall and slender, 
with her white hair and intense blue eyes. She had a lifelong interest in the natural world and went every summer to the mountains to backpack alone for days and weeks at a time. She was a truly independent woman. She got acquainted with a group of Native Americans uh, in those mountains. She came to know them, and they gave her a spirit name, which I've always loved. She who paddles her own canoe. (laughs) Well, she was that kind of a woman. She earned her first doctorate in microbiology, but she rejected the first job she was offered that was heading an early virology laboratory because she felt that she needed to work more closely with people, not test tubes. So she returned to Stanford University to study medicine. And while there, she met some Jungian analysts and she entered Jungian analysis. And it soon became clear to her that her vocation would be as a Jungian analyst. She took a psychiatric residency and then joined the newly formed Society of Jungian Analysts of Northern California. Her role on the West Coast was similar to that of Esther Harding on the East Coast and in New York. The way that I got to know Elizabeth Osterman best was through the women's group of Jungian analysts of the Bay Area. She was instrumental in forming this group. And we used to meet uh, about once a month in one of the analysts' homes, women only, and um, she always was there. In the tradition of Jung, she favored an organization that was, was as little organized as possible. And what we used to do, we women would sit in a circle and usually there were maybe 15 to 20. And one by one, each would speak to the cons- her concerns of the moment, whether it was the death of a parent, the breakup of a marriage, ill feeling towards someone in the group, being made to move from her home. Whatever she wanted to bring in, she could bring in. And the beautiful part of it was that we began to understand each other in a way that I I can't imagine that would have been possible in any other way. There was complete openness, and one of the rules was that we didn't criticize and we didn't make suggestions. We didn't try to solve their problems. But we just listened, and if somebody needed to express a feeling of understanding, they would do that. Occasionally, somebody would talk about a similar experience that they'd had. But there was nothing pejorative, nothing that smacked of trying to, to know better than that person. There was this complete sharing and this beautiful, intensive listening, which I think is the most important gift that an analyst or anyone else can give to another person. Uh, one of my analysts said to me once, uh, the, she was just a training candidate, and she finally got the, and she <coughs> was finally got the message. She said, "You know, I know that at last. What what's the most important thing about being an analyst?" I said, "Yes, what?" She said, "Being there, showing up, being there." something to think about. I grew to love Elizabeth Osterman also. And when I thought about leaving the Jungian group in San Francisco to return to my original hometown of Cleveland, Ohio, I went to talk to her about it. By this time, she had retired from her practice. She was living alone in the treetops in Mill Valley in a small house. I mean, she wasn't living in the treetops, but you felt that she was because it was a little woodsy cabin and uh, you looked out, you saw the branches. 
I remember driving up the twisting mountain road until I found a little side street called St. Jude and turning onto the dirt driveway that led down a hill to a small cabin. It was made of dark stained wood and it was unequivocally part of nature. Everything in the house seemed to have grown there organically. She seemed content. And I asked her, Elizabeth, what do you do here all this time all alone? And she replied simply, I'm composting. (laughs) She was gathering together all the bits and pieces of her relationships to all those whom she had taught and mentored and healed and digging them into Mother Earth from where they would enrich the lives and strength for another generation. Composting is a worthy occupation for a gardener of souls. Why, I have asked myself, were there so many women among the analysts who were analyzed and trained by Jung? Why was the first generation of analysts composed predominantly of women? Jung's, well, let's look at Jung's background. His relationship with his own mother was mysterious and unsatisfying. There were dim intimations of trouble in his parents' marriage from the very beginning. His mother and father were temporarily separated when he was three years old. Carl remained with his father while his mother had to spend several months in a hospital. Had something to do he always thought with their separation from each other. And an elderly aunt took care of him. He was deeply troubled by his mother being away. He writes in memories, dreams, and reflections. From then on, talking about his mother's absence, I always felt mistrustful when the word love was spoken. The feeling I associated with women for a long time was that of innate unreliability. Later, he says, these early impressions were revised. I have trusted men friends and have been disappointed by them, and I have mistrusted women and was not disappointed by them. So I wondered from early on If Jung sought out women who were caring and committed and who would be loyal to him and who would be present for him, this was the kind of woman he chose for patience and whom he would train as analysts and who would be his friends and confidants. And they, thrilled and flattered that a man of Jung's standing would see promise in them, would be grateful to him and would do all that they could to pass on his ideas with those with whom they came in contact as analysts and students and friends. And also they wrote and they mostly wrote about Jung and helped to promote his work and give it a wider readership. Jung on his side helped them to find productive expression for their feelings and for their intellects as well. They helped Jung find the nurturance and affection that he sought because he needed it so much. So I've told you a little about some of the Jungian women of the first generation following Jung that I had the very great privilege of knowing. They set an example to those of us who would follow them. They selflessly encouraged us. They inspired us. They suffered through with us. The debt I owe to them is immeasurable. There is, they are all gone now, and there is no way I can express my appreciation of the, groundworking, of the groundbreaking work that they did. They midwifed the next generation. They birthed us. They nurtured us. They forgave us our fa- failings, and they won our trust. They led us to the deeper and the higher levels of consciousness and sustained us when we faltered. 
I am so pleased to have been able to be here this, this evening and to share with you some of my remembrances of the first generation of Jungian women. They were very precious to me, and I'll never forget them. And I'm glad to know that there are more Jungians, male and female, who are being nurtured by the legacy that Jung and the women around him left. So if you like and have some questions, we can take a few minutes. Let's see where we are. A few minutes. And um, I'd be interested in any of your reactions or memories or whatever you want to mention. I just take a couple of minutes and get a couple of deep breaths and I will too. Can you say anything about Jane Wheelwright too? Oh, Mary, um, I knew Jane Wheelwright, but I didn't know her very well. But she was a very wonderful woman. She also was an outdoor woman. She came from a family of ranchers, I believe, and she had a certain freedom about her. She was married to a man who would have been very dominating if she had let him, but uh, he couldn't get away with it. <laughs> and uh, Joe's, Joe's a great guy. And the two of them, I think, were so different. She was quiet and thoughtful, and he was outgoing and I think the only way that they got along, and, and they got along as far as I could see very well, was that both of them had terrific senses of humor. There are so many, aren't there? Yes. Did you ever meet um, Christine Mann? No. But I know, have heard of her from a lot from Esther Harding. She was... Um, the Young Institute Library in, in um, New York was named after her, and she was one of the founding mothers there. Yes, Mary Lou. Remember when uh, Esther Harding came to uh, in, in your apartment? Yes, you were there. Yes, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. And Roland, your husband. You uh, remember her saying that she was going to give us a curtain lecture. Tell us, tell me, because I really don't. Really don't. Well, I was so enamored anyway, just being in her presence, and, and she looked at us the same way you're looking at me, and, and um, she said, "Well, in, uh, in England, uh, our beds are curtain." And uh, the big four posters, and so if you get curtain lectures, it's what you say to your sweetie behind the curtains that nobody else will know. And that was the way she treated uh, her uh, discussion with us as a kind of intimate storyteller. She was a pretty wonderful lady. Well, now we've heard from somebody who was there. Yes. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more. The dual relationship, um, I thought it was a very nice way of putting it. Um, you said that it didn't really seem to work because one could get caught in transference, counter-transference, and maybe not get out of it. However, um, the women that Jung had um, his relationships with, both as a teacher and as a mentor and, and so on, uh, the women uh, seemed to come out of that relationship extraordinarily creative, uh, productive, eloquent, elegant in their, you know, and I'm not attributing all of that to Jung, but perhaps the relationship was um, very vital. I think you're right about that. I think it was a vital relationship. And they, both Jung and the person he was working with, the woman he was working with, profited from the relationship. 
I think that we do get a great deal out of somebody that we're engaged with emotionally. But I think that it was a different time then. Uh, analysis was at the very beginning, and we didn't know we didn't know the pitfalls. And most of the many of the early analysts had difficulties; they got too enmeshed. But uh, on the other hand, what you say is quite right that the women did come out, did uh, develop in ways they might not have otherwise. I think it was maybe a, an intermediate stage be, before women could do it on their own. They had to be, in a way, helped and mentored and given this extra, extra dimension of relationship. Murray, would you like to say something about that? Um, I think it's a very complicated matter. Uh, uh, you know, it's so controversial, Jung's relationship with women. And yes. It was exactly, and how intimate was it, and with whom? I think if you take somebody like Liliana Fry, for instance, uh, there's a person who uh, had a very close intense, I don't know how intimate relationship with him, uh, but really did retain her own personality, had a life outside of him, had a marriage, had her mm-hmm. own outside interests, and she was somehow saved from getting brought too much into the orbit of him. The ones who weren't married or didn't have yes. such of an outside life, I think got drawn into this, uh, into a kind of identification with him, and you know, it's a real question, did somebody like von Franz individuate, or did she simply identify with him and kind of live out his, his mind, you know, uh, a kind of unembodied life almost, extremely brilliant. Yes. I listening to von Franz's lecture, and it was like God speaking. I've never heard such a lecture in my life. Uh, but it was total mind, and, and people said she talks exactly like Jung, you know, if Jung were here, it's the same accent, the same tongue, uh, the same way of expressing himself. It's almost like she took him into herself and, and, and made him so her own that you wonder, where was she? That's, That's just a question. I don't know. Uh, and I felt, I felt that about several of the women. Jaffe, for example. Not so much Jacoby because she was she was tough. She was tough. She had children. She had her husband. Yeah, I think it's the women who didn't have a, a primary relationship with a man that fell into this. Yes. Tony Wilkin. Well, I never knew her, so I didn't bring her in. But uh, Barbara Hanna, in her biography of Young, goes in at at great length goes on about her, the relationship with Tony Wolf. And I, I just can't say much because uh, I think that she too was one of those women who was not married and who was in some kind of a what Jung used to call participation mystique <laughs> sort of in the same dream world uh, with with him, but it's only from hearsay. I I've never talked to anybody about that. When I one thing at the Young Institute, if you try to talk about some of these touchy subjects, you would be met with a stone wall. <laughs> at least I was. <laughs> from what you're saying and I think that it would be um, terrible uh, a terrible um, injustice to to judge um, it was a different time and, and um, this was extraordinarily important 
phenomenon that was happening. And particip the participation mystique, I don't know how one could really avoid it. Um, you have to have a very strong ego and maybe, um, or a, an awareness, you know. And as you were saying, uh, a primary relationship outside of that would help. Yes, it was such a different time. I mean, women were just beginning to to feel their not their power, but the possibility of having some. Well, didn't women in Switzerland only receive the ability to vote in 1960 or something? Yeah, but they had uh, the pill before we did. <laughs> They were doing some some quite advanced work thinking. Well, I think we have gone as far as we need to this evening, and thank you all for listening and being with us. It was a wonderful evening, and we thank you, June. Uh, before we break up this evening, I just want to be sure that everybody knows that this will go on again tomorrow with additional wonderful speakers. And also, before we leave tonight, uh, somewhere I saw Sue Rosenthal. Where is she? Sue, would you please tell people about our event that's coming up? Want to come up and do it? Hi, if you want to hear about Tony Wolf, tune in tomorrow. I'll tell you about it. On November 30th, uh, Friday night, a group of us, um, analyst board members, are going to do a pan uh, an open forum, and we specifically want it to be that. It will be on the 9-11 event and its aftermath, and our own feelings, concerns about it, we hope filtered through a Jungian perspective, maybe not, depending on who, who is up, who's doing this. There'll be somewhere between six and ten of us here in this room. We invite you all to come. It's open. It's free. We're going to do a fishbowl kind of arrangement so that the audience, you, uh, will be very much involved and asked for your, you know, what's on your minds. Uh, subject to what uh, after what's happened, so please come. I think it will be interesting. Bye. So, with that as a final conclusion, we invite you to talk with each other, talk with June, and please come back tomorrow. Good night. This podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it all you like as long as you maintain the attribution to the speaker, but please do not change it or sell it. If you like this episode, tell your friends about us or leave us a review on iTunes. For more information about classes, training programs, videos, audio, this podcast, or to find a Jungian analyst near you, visit our website, www.jungchicago.org.